Verehrte Kolleginnen Colleagues, Excellencies, I'm pleased to welcome you to this year's annual security review conference of the OSCE. <clears throat> the agenda for this conference was adopted by the decision of the PC dated 9 June and the detailed program was circulated by the chairmanship on the 23rd of June. We will be devoting three days to core challenges to European security and we will be discussing fresh input on how to rise to those challenges. I warmly welcome you to this significant and I hope productive dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gratified to greet the Secretary General of the OSCE, Ambassador Lamberto Rosanier, and um, the Director General of the United Nations Office at Geneva, Mr. Michael Müller, as well as the Special Representative of the German Federal Government for the 2016 OSCE Chairmanship, Federal Bundestag MP Dr. Gernot Elder. He will be speaking in representation of the Chairman in Office, Foreign Minister, Frank Walter Steinmeier, and together with Secretary General Zanier and Mr. Meller will be inaugurating this year's ASRC. We are particularly privileged under German chairmanship to greet the former president of East Timor, Timor Leste, in our midst today, Dr. Ramos Horta. We have invited you so that you may describe your lifelong commitment to the peaceful settlement of disputes in your country and share this with participating states of the OSCE. We are indeed honoured that a Peace Nobel Prize laureate will make the keynote speech. Distinguished colleagues, the press would like to be present during the inaugural speeches and would also like to hear the chairperson of the FSC, Ambassador Adam Buskanski, subject to your consent, I will allow this. Thank you. Now I would call on the Secretary General of the OSCE, Ambassador Lamberto Zanier, to inaugurate the ASRC. The floor is yours. Um, Dr. Ramos Horta, Director General Müller, Special Representative Erla, Ambassador Paul, Ambassador Bugaiski, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2016 Annual Security Review Conference. The complex state of affairs in European security will give us plenty of opportunity for lively discussions with our high-level expert speakers. And today we feel particularly honored to have former President and Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize laureate uh, Dr. Ramos Horta address us with a much-anticipated keynote speech. A few days ago, we debated ways to revive cooperative security and OSC Security Days event in Berlin. We discussed options for fostering stability and predictability in the political military sphere, ways to bridge economic integration processes and joint responses to global and transnational threats. The event was preceded by a night owl session on protecting fundamental freedoms in times of crisis. As expected, different perceptions and divergent interpretations of the origins of the current impasse continue to shape our interaction. But there is also a realization that we cannot simply give up on seeking a convergence of interest wherever this appears possible. There are many ideas on how to reduce tensions and prevent crises from turning into a conflict. Agreement on a significant second set of OSC confidence-building measures on cyber security earlier this year point to the possibilities for consensus if we apply ourselves to finding common ground. In Berlin, a number of participants spoke out in favor of revitalizing and broadening the discussion on strengthening arms control and confidence security building measures. At first sight, prospects are discouraging. But the case for rekindling dialogue to dispel misperception and misunderstandings is compelling. For instance, establishing a neutral mechanism for, finding, for military fact-finding, challenge inspections under an OSC flag rather than by sending national inspectors, or even a centralized and institutionalized OSC verification or inspection mechanism are some of the suggestions that we may wish to consider. 
the OSC as the most inclusive platform for dialogue in our region should play a significant role. Rebuilding trust and confidence is a long-term process, but we have no option but to keep trying. The crisis in and around Ukraine, the topic of our first session this afternoon, continues to, the, to be the most challenging issue on our agenda. While the resolution of the crisis continues to elude us, we remain committed to reducing tensions and supporting full adherence to the ceasefire and the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Returning the heavy weapons to verifiable storage sites and disengaging from the line of contact remain of paramount importance in this regard. The SMM continues to fulfill its mandate in very difficult circumstances. There has been an upsurge in violence over recent months. Our monitors are all too often restricted in their freedom of movement or put under pressure in other ways. Patrols come under small arms fire. Vehicles are stopped at gunpoint, cameras disabled, and UAVs jammed or simply shot down. Such behavior is unacceptable and undermines the SMM's ability to carry out its important tasks. The unmotivated temporary detention of, S of an SM SSM local, uh, SMM local staff member earlier this month was another incident that should, uh, that should never have happened. There are limits to what a purely civilian monitoring mission can do in such adverse conditions. Calls for an armed OSC presence in connection with the need to provide a secure environment for the elections in non-government controlled areas of Donbas have met with resistance on the ground. Confusion on this issue has negatively impacted on the security of the SMM and may have provoked some of the incidents we have witnessed over the past weeks. While we stand ready to support discussion on possible scenarios involving armed personnel, we must clearly articulate that the SMM is an unarmed civilian mission and will remain so unless a formal decision is taken with the consent of all 57 participating states. In response to the crisis in and around Ukraine, the OSC has demonstrated flexibility in a complex crisis management environment. The lessons that we continue to identify as we adapt to new challenges on the ground have sparked a renewed debate on OSC capabilities and capacities across the conflict cycle. The roundtable discussions convened by the chairmanship over the past few months have been very useful in this regard adding external views to the discussion between participating states. One idea, among many that have been brought up in the course of these roundtables, is that of broadening our approach to early warning by including a stronger focus on transnational security challenges, which by their very nature are not confined to specific participating states, we can broaden our perspective in line with a more challenging and complex security environment that we are all confronted with. In this context, I very much look forward to tomorrow's conflict cycle discussion. Beyond the crisis in and around Ukraine, and perhaps even more so than in the past years, we need to keep focused on other conflict situations in the OSC area, some of which have deteriorated over recent months. In particular, the situation around Nagorno-Karabakh and the serious uptick in violence along the line of contact is of grave concern. Here, there is an, an urgent need to make full use of the existing negotiation format, recommit to a peaceful settlement and step up efforts to introduce confidence and security building measures. A stronger OSC monitoring presence on the ground could play a stabilizing role. Ladies and gentlemen, today Europe is exposed to multiple security challenges that range from instability and armed conflict to violent extremism and terrorism, organized crime and trafficking in arms, drugs and human beings. Other global challenges such as climate change, environmental degradation, demographic disparities and the impact of economic differentials are adding to the complexity of our security environment. Against this backdrop, the massive influx of refugees and illegal migrants is a formidable test for our adherence to humanitarian principles and fundamental values, solidarity and effective burden sharing. The OSC is already engaged in highly relevant areas such as border management, labour migration and countering human trafficking, 
but also human rights monitoring, tolerance, and non-discrimination. At the Rome OSC Security Days of Migration in March, participants stressed the need for an integrated strategy, looking both at the fight against organized crime, people smuggling, and terrorism, as well at inclusion and sustainable development. We will have a dedicated session on migration in Terelia with Ambassador Wild, who, on behalf of the chairmanship, is conducting a series of informal meetings ahead of a special permanent council meeting on the 20th of July. I'm confident that this process will help us to strengthen the coherence and effectiveness of our action. We're also called upon to contribute to the UN Summit on Migration in September. It is therefore fortunate that we could convince the UN Special Representative and Secretary General of International Migration, Peter Sutherland, to come and deliver a keynote presentation to the OSCE. We must also rise to the challenge of responding to the corrosive appeal of violent extremism that might lead to terrorism. To be successful, we need to strengthen cooperation at all levels. In this context, the OSC could do more to engage with cities and local authorities, many of which are doing frontline work in their communities. In autumn, I plan to convene an OSC Security Days for mayors to better include their perspective into our discussions. Cities are crucial security actors in a quickly urbanizing world. They need to foster tolerance and inclusion in an increasingly multicultural neighborhood, protect people and critical infrastructure for terrorism and other security risks, <coughs> make smart use of new digital technologies, promote sustainable economic development and respond to environmental challenges. They are at the forefront of global trends and often incubators of solutions to global problems tapping into their experience and exchanging best practices, best practices could be highly rewarding. In our multipolar and multifaceted security environment, we need to build strong partnerships and coalitions at all levels, with international regional organizations, our Mediterranean and Asian partners, civil society, young people, the media and academia. As the Chairmanship's Connectivity Conference demonstrated, it is essential to link up with business actors that share similar security concerns. In concluding, the annual Security Review Conference is a format that has given impetus to many of our discussions in the past. I therefore look forward to constructive and forward-looking debate that can help to rejuvenate the culture of cooperation and joint action that is the OSC true source of strength. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary General, for your words of welcome, but also your very substantive contribution to our discussions over the next three days. Colleagues, it is a special pleasure to now call on the Director General of the UN Office at Geneva, Mr. Michael Möller, and invite him to deliver the message of greeting of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. The floor is yours, sir. Secretary General, Mr. President, Dr. Erla, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to be here with you this morning at this important meeting to discuss European security at such a crucial moment in time. The Secretary General could not be with you today and he has asked me to represent him and it is my privilege to read his message. And I quote, I am pleased to send greetings to all participants at this OEC annual review conference. And I commend OEC Chairman and Office, German Foreign Minister Frank Walter Steinmeier, Steinmeier for his leadership. Europe is facing broad, severe and intertwined challenges. Its economy is emerging unevenly from a decade of economic turbulence. The arrival of refugees and migrants is causing strains, especially politically. Conflicts are also destabilizing the OEC area. The situation in eastern Ukraine remains serious. The Minsk agreements must be implemented without delay. The United Nations will continue to support, if and as requested, the OSCE's capacities to fulfill its important mandates to peacefully resolve the conflict in Ukraine. There is potential for further instability from protracted conflicts across the continent. One stark reminder was the upsurge in violence earlier this year along the line of contact in Nagorno-Karabakh and along the Armenian-Azerbaijani border. We must also ensure that we preserve all gains made in the decades following conflict in the Western Balkans. I am concerned about the re-emergence of nationalism, xenophobia and isolationist political parties. I am also deeply worried about the rise in polarization and short-term national thinking 
over long-term global solutions. Now is a time to enhance the invaluable cooperation between the OEC and the United Nations. Our efforts in the area of preventive diplomacy are a model for others. On the ground, we work together from Europe to Central Asia. The UN Regional Center for Preventive Diplomacy for Central Asia has proven its value in supporting the countries of the region in addressing violent extremism and other cross-border threats. I welcome the call by the OSCE Chair in Office for renewing dialogue, rebuilding trust and restoring security. As we work to pursue these goals, we need to devise joint strategies according to our respective strengths. There are naturally differences in our approach. Our memberships overlap but are not, are not the same. Resources and capacities vary. Negotiation strategies may prioritize different objectives. The close strategic dialogue between the UN and the OEC is set up to harness our respective strengths when we work together. Now we are reinforcing the UN's capacities in Vienna to work with the OEC on peace and security. And I deeply appreciate the support of the chairmanship and office in this effort. As you squarely confront the prevailing realities with a view to bolstering our collective ability to prevent and resolve conflict, I assure you of the UN's commitment to continue supporting the OSCE and its, and its confidence in our strong partnership. That was the Secretary General's message. And I thank you for the invitation and join the Secretary General in reaffirming the United Nations' firm commitment to continue the strong cooperation with the OSCE. At the United Nations office at Geneva, where we regularly host the Geneva International Discussions dealing with the aftermath of the 2008 war in Georgia, in collaboration with the OSCE, we look forward to working closely with you for a more peaceful future. The implementation of the cross-cutting 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and other frameworks that the international community is pursuing offers a unique opportunity to further deepen our collaboration. Thank you very much. <coughs> Many thanks to you, Director General, for the statement conveying support for the OSCE's efforts. I will now call on the Special Representative of the Federal Government for the OSCE Chairmanship, Dr. Gernot Eller, to address the gathering of participating states. Lieber Lamberto Zanier. Lamberto Zanier, Presado Presidente, Ramos Horta, Mr. Muller, Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the OSCE Chairperson in Office, Foreign Minister Chinmaya, let me bid you all a very warm welcome to the ASRC 2016. Annual Security Review Conference. That's not a very catchy title, and if you ask me, it's maybe even a bit misleading these days, as if we could just inspect security in the OSC area once a year, like a safety inspection on an elevator or a kitchen gadget. Slap a safety check sticker on the side, job done. We can't expect that, especially not at a time when our shared security is by no means assured or to be taken for granted. We therefore mustn't see our meeting as a ritualized duty our focus in the days ahead must be dialogue, its tone characterized by mutual confidence and its content, while honest, scrupulously constructive. Ladies and gentlemen, we are experiencing a period of uncertainty and political upheaval. The latest example is the sovereign decision taken by the people of the United Kingdom, a decision that we must respect, but that many including myself, find extremely regrettable and a cause for serious reflection. However, these are not just uncertain times that we have to deal with together. They are also times in which peace on the European continent is not only threatened, but has actually been violated. This is unacceptable, and we are unequivocal in our condemnation. Fundamental principles and shared values have been and are being called into question. Our shared security is under threat from within and from outside. Comparison with the Cold War, 
though frequently cited, doesn't cover it. The situation in security policy today is much more multifaceted. We find ourselves confronted with the confusing synchronicity of diverse challenges. That means we can no longer think in terms of simple categories. That's not doom and gloom. It's an objective observation. However, we cannot just accept that status quo and carry on fueling an undesirable and dangerous spiral. The security challenges of today are far too great for individual countries and their citizens. The transnational threats of the 21st century are too complex, both in the digital sphere and elsewhere. These threats are no longer contained by national borders and not even restricted by intercontinental borders or by the limits of our institutions. So we have to keep rethinking and talking about our options and intentions for joint approaches to those common challenges. And we need to build on our collaborations. The OSCE, for example, should expand its cooperation with our partners in the Mediterranean region and in Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, we can no longer allow ourselves to believe that key questions of territorial integrity, self-determination, minority rights, counter-terrorism, cybersecurity, and migration management can be answered with the same old way of thinking from inside our protected cocoon. If we want greater security, indeed the basis of lasting peace, then we need negotiated, collective and sensible approaches that are equal to the heightened complexity of these new challenges. I quote, there are no shortcuts to peace. Peace is a journey that must be reached step by step, a foundation that has to be built block by block. End of quotation. These are the words of our guest today, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Jose Ramos Horta. Peace is possible if we pull together in one direction, if we behave in the truest sense of the word, constructively. That strategy, stepping up to the plate and renewing or building on offers of dialogue and cooperation is the strategy Germany's OSCE chairmanship has been pursuing consistently for half a year, or has attempted to pursue. We intend to do the same at this ASRC. We need to leave our diplomatic comfort zone and learn to call a spade a spade when it comes to the conflicts and differences of opinion that divide us. In the interest of constructive dialogue, we should also be prepared to see things from the other side's point of view, although it may appear difficult and uncomfortable at times. I believe we will only make progress if we put empty compromise and lip service behind us, as well as the stubborn insistence that our position is the only true and right one. In view of all of this, I very much welcome the first ever inclusion on the ASRC's agenda of a frank and unequivocal point, an item about the unresolved regional conflicts in the OSCE area. This gives us an opportunity to engage in open dialogue, to discuss joint ways of coming through these crises and resolving conflicts. More than ever, those conflicts represent a considerable challenge for all of us, particularly for the directly affected local populations. We should not adopt a kind of fatalism that labels many of these conflicts as frozen, quote-unquote. People are bearing the brunt in their everyday lives, year after year. That suffering is not frozen. Their basic freedoms and human rights curtailed, while development in the affected regions regresses or at best stagnates. After all, our priority ought to be to work for small but meaningful steps towards stabilization. This is the only way to make everyday life easier for people 
and work towards robust long-term solutions. Dedication and a commitment to the art of the possible. That is also the strategy guiding, guiding Foreign Minister Steinmeier on the trip he's just embarked on to Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia. In the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, fatal incidents along the line of contact have been legitimated for decades. That legitimation needs at long last to be abandoned. We welcome and fully support the intensification of negotiation activities within the OSCE framework. In Georgia, likewise, the situation remains anything but satisfactory. Nevertheless, some progress has recently been achieved as regards practical cooperation between those affected. We need to maintain this momentum and underpin it with confidence-building measures and humanitarian action. Similar points apply with respect to the Transnistria conflict. Our special representative, Claude Meyer-Claude, will go into greater detail on our efforts in this area this very afternoon. In the Ukraine conflict, all sides need to live up to their responsibilities. The ceasefire in eastern Ukraine is constantly being violated and the political process is faltering. Playing the blame game won't help. Obligations that have been entered into need to be fulfilled. The framework conditions that will make it easier to do so must be established for the long term. First and foremost, this means upholding the ceasefire unconditionally and granting the special monitoring mission full access, free from obstacles and threats. Lamberto Zeni has already made mention of this. There also has to be a stop to the obstruction and destruction of technical equipment, such as drones and cameras. The SMM must not be blinded. We need the SMN if the ceasefire in eastern Ukraine is to be stabilized long term. As the conflict particularly has demonstrated, the OSCE can make the crucial difference. There shall be no impunity for such offenses. The capacity of the OSCE to respond to situations and its experience of similar observation and mediation missions are a real asset to the European security architecture. Our core objective as OSCE chair is to enhance the organization's capabilities and to make the best possible use of its potential for crisis resolution, both independently and in collaboration with other international players, above all the United Nations. This applies in relation to the entire conflict cycle, from early detection and conflict prevention to conflict resolution and post-conflict peacebuilding. It also involves ensuring that appropriate staffing and funds are in place. Ladies and gentlemen, an improvement to security in Europe can only be effective if it reaches all of us. The OSCE has always stood for the cooperative approach and the comprehensive concept of security. And we need to redouble our efforts in that regard. We all have an interest in achieving more security for the long term, with fewer weapons, more military restraint, with transparency, and with balanced ceilings. In this phase of fresh uncertainty in Europe, we need to think hard about how to make that happen. Disarmament and arms control have played a crucial role in improving security on our continent. It's undeniable that they benefit all of us. However, the regimes for conventional arms control and confidence and security building measured agreed post-1990 are no longer sufficient to meet all the challenges we face at present. We therefore need to update our existing toolkits. To reflect the challenges of today, we need more crisis resilience, more transparency, more effective verification, prevention of dangerous military 
incidents as we witness at this point in time constantly. In short, we need more genuine cooperative security. Concrete proposals are on the table. Let's discuss them in a spirit of mutual trust and focused endeavor. We do need to have achieved real progress at the end of the day. Pretty speeches won't help us in the long term. Words must be followed up by deeds. Ladies and gentlemen, as the world's largest regional arrangement under Chapter 8 of the UN Charter, the OSCE has taken on special responsibility for peace and stability. However, it or, and we can only live up to that responsibility if we find joint responses to new challenges while crucially remaining true to our principles and standing up for our convictions. Standing up for convictions, for human dignity and the rule of law, for the freedom of his country and his people, by peaceful means, in a perseverant manner, that was the path Jose Ramos Orta chose. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced that it does us good to take a moment sometimes to engage with other people's experience without wishing to draw comparisons. I feel the resolution of the Timor-Leste conflict can be a source of both inspiration and ideas. For post-conflict peace-building, internal and external stabilization efforts, conflict management within society, or reconciliation work. Esteemed President Ramos Orta, we are eagerly awaiting your statement. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ella. Colleagues, we greet in our midst today as our keynote speaker at this ASRC, the former president of Timor-Leste and 1995 Nobel Peace Laureate, Dr. José Ramos Orta, Excellency, the floor is yours. Mr. Secretary General, the, the Special Representative of the German Federal Government, uh, Chairperson, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real uh, privilege, a pleasure to be here. I have to start by apologizing. I arrived this morning. I wrote my speech, uh, my remarks, a bit after 1 a.m., after the plane took off from Bangkok to Vienna. So my apologies if you find my speech a, a, a bit uh, rumbling, because uh, I did write it in, in its entirety during the flight. So I hardly uh, slept, so my apologies. I've been uh, in Austria on a number of occasions in the past, and each time I departed with more fond uh, memories. And I thank OSC host, uh, the uh, federal government of Austria, uh, for uh, making my trip uh, uh, <clears throat> possible. Uh, you are convening here at a time when Europe and much of the world are confronted with a multitude of ever more complex and interconnected social, political, economic and security challenges that threaten to unravel even a multinational institution as solid as the European Union and some of its constituting states. Many are still trying to make sense of the result of the UK referendum on EU, EU, EU membership. Rather than uniting and strengthening European unity and cooperation in the face of the ever more complex challenge faced by all, there are centrifugal forces tearing Europe apart. Those in England, the so-called eurosceptics, who saw the seeds of British exit from the EU have paved the way for a much diminished UK in size and influence in Europe and the world. Will the Queen be able to prevent the splintering of the Kingdom? I have to say, you know, uh, I have a personal deep affinity with Europe, have been travelling all over Europe over the years. And uh, for many of you it might be news, but I was the one who, in uh, 2000, end of 2008, I nominated the European Union for the Nobel Peace Prize, and I repeated again in 2010. 
And what were my line of argument with the Nobel Committee in uh, Oslo? Uh, and I said, uh, way back when uh, uh, human rights were not fashionable uh, anywhere in the world, every time we, uh, at the receiving end of uh, violence tyranny, we needed a voice, we would go to the European Parliament, even when the European Parliament was mostly toothless at the time. But it was a very reliable forum. And then over the years, the European Union was in the forefront of speaking out and paying a price on uh, speaking out on human rights. Over the years, the European Union is in the forefront on uh, free trade or fair trade with Cotonou Agreement, uh, uh, Lomé Convention before that, uh, everything but arms initiative, etc. And, uh, but also, uh, he nominated the Nobel, uh, the uh, European Union to the Nobel, uh, for the Nobel Peace Prize was also uh, in recognition of the extraordinary achievements of uh, reconciliation after the uh, uh, devastation of World War II and uh, what it was achieved in a relatively short period of time. When you look at some conflicts today in Asia, uh, China, Japan, Korea, Japan, 60 years later, there is still uh, profound uh, tensions among them, and uh, Europeans uh, set an example of reconciliation. So, we, uh, uh, from the developing countries, countries like Timor-Leste, we want to see a stronger united uh, European Union. So, we follow with concern, interest, and the developments uh, in the UK and uh, in Europe. That's uh, my concern. At the cauldron of the Middle East wars and the endemic poverty plaguing much of the African continent have uprooted more than 60 million people. And of these, may, may, many have, may have sought and are seeking shelter and a new life in the whole continent. Some European leaders and people have shown great heart in welcoming the, their fellow human beings, fleeing wars and deprivation. But understandably, other European leaders and communities have been less generous, reacting often out of ignorance and fear. And let me clarify that when I use the word understandably, I'm not condoning the xenophobic mindset of many in Europe. I'm simply saying that in any given society, different people act or react differently in similar circumstances. The U.S., Canada, Latin America, the U.S., Canada, Latin American states, Australia, and New Zealand are very much a product of the religious, religious wars and extreme poverty in Europe that prompted the greatest movement of people ever in previous centuries. We are, we are today living witnesses to an ongoing and irreversible demographic transformation of Europe, a continuation or repetition of the massive movement of people in previous centuries caused by wars and poverty in Europe that prompted millions of Europeans to flee to the Americas. No matter how high and thick your walls are, there will be no fortress Europe that can stem the tide of people fleeing wars and poverty. The demographic transformation of Europe from a predominantly aging Judeo-Christian continent to a vibrant and younger multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural Europe is unstoppable. These phenomena are not always entirely peaceful, and sadly, many will suffer immensely, but with wisdom, determination, and compassion, Europe will emerge rejuvenated and stronger in the long run. Some decades ago, the principle of inviolability of colonial boundaries inherited by the newly independent African states, carved out by 19th century European powers, was strictly upheld by all. The first to challenge this taboo were the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, waging a successful protracted war resulting in the cessation of Eritrea from Ethiopia. The second successful cessation was Christian South Sudan, seceding from the northern Arab majority of Sudan. In both cases, cessation didn't result in peace, greater freedom and prosperity. The euphoria didn't last long as the newly independent South Sudan imploded with extraordinary ferocity. Eritrea is also a tragic story of a dream turned nightmare. These phenomena that were thought of as malaise of the developing world seem to have contaminated the well-established European nation states. 
we are now witnessing real possibility of Scotland or Northern Ireland parting ways and Catalonia parting ways with Spain. But in, in reality, the fragmentation of 20th century European nation state was unleashed more than 20 years ago when the shaky ground upon which the mighty Soviet Union was erected collapsed. Americans and Western Europeans celebrated the dismantling of Berlin Wall, the demise of SUSSR, the end of post-World War II Yugoslavia, and did not think twice in moving EU and NATO boundaries eastwards, ever closer to the gates of the weakened and the hungry Russian bear. But again, the euphoria lasted only as long as it lasted. The above points of past, recent, and ongoing phenomena should help us reach some conclusions. Empires, regimes, governments, elected and non-elected, come and go. From the glittering Roman empires to the rise and fall of the Third Reich, the rise and fall of the Soviet Union, American triumphalism, the rise of China and India, are all passing phenomena, and only the people are a permanent feature, born and survive in the midst of wars, starving and dying of poverty in the, in the midst of opulence of some. But the people will always be there. The lesson is that whenever we think of and design institutions and projects, we must always endeavor to serve the people. The institutions and projects must be people's base, connected with the people, and the institution may adapt as people's needs, desires, and priorities evolve, change. The other lesson is no power is eternal. Empires and emperors come and go. The strong and ruler of today may be the weak and servant of tomorrow. So we must always embrace the virtue of humility and compassion, sources of greater and longer lasting power. When we are at the peak of power and privileges, our power is enhanced when we embrace the virtues of humility and compassion, embracing those on the fringe of power and opportunities. If you have a triumph in battle, do not seek to humiliate the vanquished ones. Walk towards them, your sword pointing down. Invite them to rise up and embrace and invite them to join in celebrating peace and freedom for all. Timor-Leste is a country of only a little more than one million. We survive and prevail through centuries. Portuguese colonial presence, interrupted by Japanese imperial army occupation, return of Portugal, and 24 years of occupation by Indonesia. In victory in 2002, we celebrated our freedom, but we also honored our former adversaries. We forgave our captors and the tormentors without demanding or waiting for an apology. We rejected an international tribunal to try those who committed war crimes and crimes against humanity. Many uh, Amnesty International, uh, some friends uh, in the West, didn't understand uh, why we wouldn't push for an international tribunal. For us, at the time, uh, I'm departing from my written remarks, so my apologies to the interpreters. Uh, Indonesia itself uh, was transitioned from democracy, from, two th from dictatorship to democracy. The dictatorship fell in 2008, 2009, and Indonesia confronted exceptional uh, challenges to its uh, security. Ethnic religious tensions resulted in thousands killed. Any international tribunal would only exacerbate the visions and tensions in Indonesia. And uh, for us, we also said philosophically, we are free because the Indonesians have uh, their second freedom with the dictator fall of the dictatorship. So we decided not to push for an international tribunal. <clears throat> Those who torture and they kill, did not apologize for their crimes. And they continue in denial, unable to summon enough courage and accept their part of guilt. But this is their problem. They live with their crimes in their conscience. The screams and faces of their victims still haunting them every day, every night. We are now free and refuse to be hostage of anger and hatred. Ladies and gentlemen, my European brothers and sisters, I know uh, many are here from the Far East, but allow me to talk more uh, 
to my European brothers and sisters. Look, look eastward and seek to engage Russia. Instead of moving planes, tanks, and troops closer to the Russian border, you might seek to understand the reasons of Russian pride, fears, and actions. Sound bites about Putin being the new Tsar and Russian expansionism are not going to help bring back Europe and Russia to normal levels of cooperation and the recovery of Crimea. <clears throat> this now impoverished region of the world, I mean Europe, of great nations who did great things for humanity, but also who invented the Inquisition. Colonialism, slavery, two world wars must reinvent itself as a region of solidarity and compassion to reconnect with its people, reach out to the great Russia. I am not a pacifist who believes that force must never be used. Sometimes the use of force is necessary when it is the only option available to prevent genocide. Bosnia, Rwanda, the killing fields of Cambodia are just some reminders that non-use of force to prevent genocide and mass atrocities is equivalent to surrender of our morality, a betrayal of the victims. However, the preferred option should always be prevention of conflicts, dialogue and mediation to settle disputes. And when these are actively, creatively and patiently exercised in a timely fashion, more often than not, they produce better results than the use of force. But on prevention, I would add national actors rather than external are best placed to engage in conflict prevention processes at every level, from community to national level. Ex external actors are not the best substitute and should not be the first responders. However, in some situations, credible threat of sanctions, including the threat of use of force, may help domestic actors leading prevention and mediation actions in their effort in preventing conflict from erupting. I had the unique privilege of chairing the high-level independent panel on UN peace operations appointed by the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon 2014-2015. And I'm also still co-chair of the Independent Commission on Multilateralism, a project of the International Peace Institute, both endeavoring to deliver a better, more effective and credible multilateral system anchored on the UN. My colleagues and I, a 16 panel member, produced a comprehensive report with more than 100 recommendations on how to improve overall UN role in conflict prevention and mediation, more agile and effective deployment of peace in forces and on sustaining peace. We also made far-reaching recommendations on improving leadership and coordination at the UN Secretariat level. We expect that the next UN Secretary General to be elected this fall will make it an absolute priority the full implementation of the HIPPO report and of the two other complementary reports, namely on peace building architecture and on women, peace and security. Procrastination, procrastination and failure in undertaking speedy and full implementation of the three seminal and complementary reports and recommendations will inevitably result in the UN sliding further into irrelevance. There is universal agreement that prevention should have primacy over intervention. However, while prevention might appear simple, nothing is ever simple when we are confronted with human frailties like inflated egos of leaders ignorance, prejudices, and fear. Take the tragic example of Syria. I sum up in few words three main obstacles. Overestimating one's own power, underestimating the adversary's power, and the miscalculation. In my view, all have a fail, error. The Assad regime failed for not making real effort in reaching out to those wanting more freedom. The opposition failed in overestimating their own power, refusing to negotiate with the regime, demanding, demanding instead its immediate resignation. 
and underestimating the state power and motives of the Assad regime, and failing to understand the fears of the Alawite minority in power that inspired its actions. Europeans and Americans who underestimated the Assad regime misread the complexities of the so-called Arab Spring and the euphoric with the Pyrrhic air campaign against Muammar Gaddafi believed they could arrange another regime change. All miscalculated, and we all know the consequence of this miscalculation. The consequence of, of this is what you see right in your midst in Europe, the hundreds of thousands of Syrians pleading with you to shelter them. And uh, this, uh, Excellencies, is repeated again and again. In my own country, uh, we have experienced uh, situations whereby pride, ego, come in between uh, uh, peoples uh, and then fail to engage in dialogue and address simmering problems that, if addressed timely, would not uh, spill over into open uh, conflict. This, and still today, I'm uh, being uh, sensitive and diplomatic. I wouldn't cite situations in our region, in Southeast Asia itself, in the wider Asia region, whether if less pride, less ego uh, were at play, some of the tensions in the region could have been addressed by regional actors. Europe and Russia cannot continue to drift apart this vast region with endless resources and highly motivated and educated people working in honest and innovative partnership for peace and progress can transform the world. There are more in common between Europe and Russia than what divide you. The U.S. should also rethink its relationship with China, Russia and China, treating them as equals and not as second-class powers. Whether the U.S. like it or not, China is inexorably emerging as a modern 21st Asian power. This inevitably leads to fears among China's neighbors, and this being the case, it is China, an aspiring world power, that must behave as a responsible and benevolent power and reassure its neighbors. For many in China and Russia, and indeed in many other countries, U.S. policies are always inspired by its strategic, hegemonic goals and selfish economic interests. This is an exaggeration, although it's understandable as they view the U.S. through the prism of many past U.S. policies. I have a more innocent and a benevolent view of the U.S. I'm a great fan of the Kennedys, of the immense good they they did in their time, their legacy has lasted for generations long after they have gone. American society has produced thousands of great achievers, scientists and millionaires, whose roots can be traced back to impoverished towns, ghettos and villages around the world. Another a great American president after the Kennedys will soon leave active office. In regards to the above, in regard to prevention, it's easier said than done. How can Europe or the U.S. normalize relations with Russia in the face of an accession of Crimea? But is in the U.S. also in continuing occupation of Cuba's Guantanamo? Is in the U.K. in continuation in continuing occupation of a rock on the Spanish soil called Gibraltar and the Islas Malvinas, a historic part of Argentina? And isn't Spain continuing to occupy some lands, land outposts in Morocco? It seems that very few, very few do not have a glass roof. My best advice is set aside what are, for the time being, irreconcilable differences. Re-engage with each other, explore areas and ideas of common interest, namely on how best to address the global economic financial crisis, bring an end to the conflict in Syria, address the refugee crisis in a holistic manner, both in its humanitarian dimension and political and economic dimensions. Address extremism and terrorism in a holistic manner, both through sharp intelligence and prudent action, and through understanding and resolving the root causes. Wars are not inevitable. 
and every war brings immense destruction and suffering, exacerbating tensions, rivalries, and generate more enemies. Almost every military victory is a Pyrrhic victory. So we must do more to enhance, multiply, preventive diplomacy mechanisms and initiatives. Undertake research on innovative prevention process and mediation. There are no shortcuts to peace. We build peace in our homes, in our families, in villages, in towns, block by block. Peace is the work of patient and dedicated people with missionary zeal. People who have empathy for those who suffer the most, women, children, elderly. Peacemakers must have a heart and compassion. Europe is at crossroads. The challenges are daunting, but Europeans have faced greater challenges in the past. You regroup, you reconcile, you build a greater Europe after World War II. You can do it again and do better still. You are all in my daily prayers to the Almighty to inspire you to do greater missions for Europe and for the rest of the world. And God bless you all. Thank you. Excellence. Excellency, thanks for the words of guidance to this year's annual security review conference. Before I open the floor, for participating states and discussions, I'd like to call on the chairperson of the Forum for Security Cooperation, Ambassador Adam Buchansky. Adam, I call on you. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in my capacity as the chairperson of the Forum for Security Cooperation, I'm pleased to outline the highlights of the FSC's work since the last annual security review conference. This period covers the FSC chairmanship tenures of Montenegro, Norway, the Netherlands and Poland. Let me start by recalling in the context of today's debate that the mandate of the Forum for Security Cooperation covers inter alia enhancing regular consultation and intensifying cooperation among participating states on matters related to security discussing arms control, including goals and methods for building and maintaining stability and security in the OSC region, maintaining the responsibility for the implementation of the CSBMs, and furthering the process of reducing the risk of conflict. During the reporting period, the FSC has continued to provide a platform for discussing the political-military dimension of the, of the conflict in and around Ukraine. Participating states have regularly sized the forum and exchanged views on the issue. Discussions, however, have taken place in light of deteriorating situation in the OSC region, which has reduced confidence and trust among the participating states to a low level. The implementation of the Paul Mill Aki was assessed at several seminars, meetings, consultations and assistance projects. One of, one of the most important, namely the annual implementation assessment meeting, produced 20 proposals captured in the CPC's survey of suggestions. In February 2016, the FSC held the high-level military doctrine seminar. It offered a platform for debate on military threats and doctrines among high-ranking officials and experts who exchange perceptions of the current security situation in, in Europe and its reflection in national military doctrines. As for the level of implementation of our Paul Mill commitments, it is regularly assessed through the mechanism of mandatory information exchange. The number of information exchange remains high, but there is still room for improvement in this area. With regard to the Vienna document, the FSC has continued to discuss proposals related to its updating and modernization. This topic remains a priority for the forum. Although the number of proposals have nearly doubled recently, 
and various informal meetings have been held, it remains to be seen whether consensus around adopting new VD Plus decisions will be possible this year. As regards the Code of Conduct on political military aspects of security, two annual implementation discussions took place. They offered an opportunity to identify ways to promote and improve the implementation of the Code and to examine the, its application in, in the context of the existing political and military situation. This year's discussion was also accompanied by a useful informal event, supplemented by national tables. In addition, a successful conference was organized in Berlin in June 2016, raising awareness about the Code of Conduct among parliamentarians and other representatives involved in ensuring democratic control, control and oversight of the security sector. Small arms and light weapons and stockpiles of conventional ammunition have been yet another important element of the FSC's work over the past year. Several capacity building initiatives were undertaken, including an advanced training on tracing illicit south. Furthermore, the FSC adopted a decision that enables the provision of assistance on south and stockpiles of conventional ammunition projects to partners for cooperation. Lastly, the ISC has provided, upon request, assistance to participating states on the security and management of stockpiles of south and conventional ammunition. In 2016, the OSC implements such projects in 10 countries. Sizing this opportunity, I would like to thank all donors for their continued support for the implementation of these important initiatives, which help participating states to fulfill their commitments. Turning to non-proliferation, the FSC was able to adopt an important decision regarding the OSC, OSC role in supporting UN Security Council Resolution 1540. In June this year, the FSC provided the United Nations with a substantial contribution to the 2016 Comprehensive Review of Implementation of this resolution. Additionally, an informal group of friends of UNSCR 1540 was set up in the FSC. Last but not least, let me mention the FSC Security Dialogue, which remains an excellent platform for debating key security issues with active participation of experts and eminent persons as guest speakers. Throughout the year, a variety of important topics have been discussed, ranging from regional to sub-regional aspects of security, national and international matters, and issues of cross-dimensional nature, such as arms trade or the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security. Distinguished delegates, in conclusion, let me underscore that since the last annual security review, the FSC has continued its efforts to strengthen the implementation of existing political military commitments and to discuss possible, possible additional measures. Consecutive FSC chairmanships have been making every effort to ensure effective conduct of the meetings, striving to propose interesting and relevant programs of work. However, the Forum for Security Cooperation does not function in a vacuum and the overall tense situation in the OSC region and the violation of the OSC principles and commitments have influenced debates of the FSC and their outcomes. Therefore, further efforts are required to ensure potential results with a view to the upcoming Ministerial Council in Hamburg. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I now request members of the press to leave the room.